Hi, Misha here, and let's return to U.S. aircraft with the F-111 Aardvark, or PIG if you're in Australia. This was, of course, designed by General Dynamics, although Grumman would have a hand in it, not as much as they'd originally had hoped, but it would lead to a more famous aircraft with some marked similarities. These are, of course, 172 scale die cast, and in this video, they're all going to be Hobby Master because they're pretty much the only ones who do art marks. And we're going to talk about several variants. This has a lot of variants, considering well under 600 of these airplanes are ever made. And we'll talk about the original strike aircraft used by TAC, the bomber variant used by SAC the electronic warfare variant and we'll talk about a couple of variants used by the Australian Air Force who arguably found the most success for this plane so yeah a lot to dive into here so get a drink get a snack buckle up and I don't blame you at all for watching this video in parts and sections but you know, I want to tell a complete story, and I actually have two new aircraft. One of them came in about a month ago, and the other one came in a couple of months back. I just haven't had time to really deal with them. And some I've had since, really, I started collecting Hobby Master some years back. So, excuse the dust. Let's jump in. It really is good that Hobby Master does these, because while, generally speaking, they look very, very similar... The devil's in the details, and once you know to look for them, these artworks all have very different features. We'll get into that. But yeah, I'm just glad a quality company that pays attention to the details like Hobby Master did in them. They don't always get them right, of course. No one ever does. But most of the time, they're on point. But we're going to begin with a F-111A Circa. 1975 U.S. Air Force. But of course, first we have to talk about the history. This aircraft, at least the concept behind it, goes all the way back to 1960, early summer. The U.S. Air Force was needing a new low-altitude, high-speed, penetration, medium-range interdictor type aircraft a tactical bomber, a strike aircraft. This was kind of responding to the latest in Soviet anti-aircraft systems like SAMs. Go in, deliver a payload, using the most sophisticated guidance possible. So, good fuel tankage. In fact, it needed a range of about 3,800 miles. Be able to sustain at least Mach 1.2 at low altitude. And they were interested in swing wing. Uh, because one of the other requirements was unprepared or short, relatively speaking, airfield takeoff, especially in higher weights. And, of course, uh, that was a pretty steep thing to ask of a bomber, fighter-bomber interdictor of that day and time. And uh, so it was a pretty thing. Now, swing wing was not totally new. There had been some experiments before, for example, the Bell X-5, Grumman had a Jaguar prototype, but it really wasn't ever in production. But the idea is wings fully out for low speed, you know, landing takeoff, and then retracted in for high speed dashes and, and what have you. And you know, in between for different compromises therein. The Navy too was needing a new long range slash endurance interdictor to protect the fleet it needed better missiles longer range basically just a good payload what have you and originally they were working on the douglas f6f excuse me f6d but that was actually canceled late that same year 1960 so they were needing a new aircraft but at this time they were separate no one really put them together 
and it was election year. The Eisenhower administration, after two terms, was obviously going out. Everyone knew that, and no one knew who was going to come in. So nothing much happened. Of course, the Kennedy administration came in in 61 with a new Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. And his idea was to combine and collaborate with the branches as much as possible. So as early as February of 1961, he commissioned a study to see, hey, the Air Force and the Navy both need a new aircraft. Can it be the same thing? just modified lightly for each one to fulfill their needs. Oh, and can it provide close air support too? Because, oh, we need a new close air support jet. Well, that was quickly dropped already by May. It was just determined that that was completely counter to the other needs. And so that would spin off into a different program, which would ultimately culminate in the A-7, which I've done a video on quite recently. But... As far, as far as the uh, the interdictor, the tactical fighter-bomber, Air Force and Navy, that was gone ahead with. That summer, basically, they were ordered to combine efforts. And, well, they could agree on a few things. Swing-wing, two-seat, two-engine. That was about it. <laughs> Otherwise, their needs were at least on paper, very different. But nevertheless, in September, they would basically open things up for, for proposals in the industry. And by December of 1961, you had nine companies giving their ideas. Kind of the, the, the general names of the day. You had uh, Boeing, General Dynamics, McDonnell, you had Lockheed, North American, Republic, so on and so forth. And both the Air Force and Navy took a look and weren't really all that thrilled about either any any of them. But the the best of a bad lot turned out to be Boeing and General Dynamics. Of those two most of the time, committees on either branch picked the Boeing design. Mostly because, at least on paper, it was the same aircraft, but their naval versus Air Force versions were quite different. And unfortunately, November of 1962, this is the exact reason McNamara axed the Boeing and pretty much gave his weight towards the General Dynamics because on paper, the two versions would be almost the same, 80% parts commonality. So December 21 of that year, General Dynamics received a contract for 23 so-called developmental model aircraft, and they would receive the designation of F-111A for the Air Force and F-111B for the Navy. The Air Force was taking point on this they were assigned the lead essentially the aircraft was to, to be designed for the air force and then modified accordingly to meet the needs of the navy which as you can imagine made the navy just oh so happy and uh of the 23 developmental 17 were to be the a model and five were to be the b model and one would actually be a variant we're about to talk with next the fb 111a so that's the breakdown. 63, we get a mock-up that the Navy and Air Force both looked at. And then in 64, we start to uh, get work on. The initial A model rolled out of the factory in October of 64, and it test flew at the General Dynamics facility December 21, 1964. As for the B model for the Navy, because General Dynamics we'll call them GD from now on, really didn't have a lot of experience with carrier-based aircraft. They worked with Grumman. They would do a lot of the avionics, a lot of the testing, a lot of the integration with the fleet because they, they knew. They would also be given some of the subcontracted work for some of the components for the A model too to give them, you know, a, a perk. So that's why the B model first flew May 18 from the Grumman facility, 1965. 
And so it seems like things are going pretty well on track, despite some initial hesitation. And the idea was to have, have this in service by October 1965. We're, we're behind schedule because, yeah, the development was not smooth. You might think it's the swing wing, but it really wasn't the problem. Actually, the engines, the, the Pratt & Whitney TF-30s, especially their intakes were giving issues. Some of the navigation systems, this was to have terrain following radar and an autopilot that could be set with that. Yeah, just they had a lot of issues with weight, especially with the B model. And it just didn't go smoothly for either the Air Force or the Navy. And a report in late 65 from the Navy was very scathing of the concept F-111B. It just, it just was not working out. And it's not what they wanted. But, you know, kind of turnabout's fair play because earlier the Air Force really didn't want the F-4 Phantom. That was a Navy plane. But they got it anyway, thanks to McNamara. Thankfully for the Air Force, the F-4 turned out to be a great bird, but not so much with the F-111B. Things kind of stalled. They did build the, the uh, pre-production models, and they even built a couple of so-called full-production B models, but 68 was the end for it. First, Congress would cut funding in May of 68, then in July, the program would be suspended. And then in December, it would be officially, formally axed. This really has a lot to do with the experiences in the Vietnam War. So, there goes the B model. But the F-111A model, while it had its own issues, was still alive and well. It would definitely go into U.S. Air Force Service, and that gets us to our first one city two scale die cast hobby master model on the spinny thing today. Despite the hardships, the setbacks, the difficulties, and the Navy dropping out, the Air Force would persevere, and the first production models would be delivered July of 1967, and they would make their way to squadrons by October of that year for field testing. And very quickly, Six would be sent to Vietnam Project in March of 1968. And, it, well, it wouldn't go as planned. Combat Lancer Program, they sent them over to Southeast Asia for testing and trials. Now, these are the original F-111As. These were initially powered by the TF-30P1s, but soon upgraded to the TF-30 P3 engines. One thing I should mention, the cockpit, of course it has seating for two, on the left is your pilot, on the right, weapons officer, and they're not in ejection seats, it's actually a capsule. And that was, that was originally something done for the Navy, for the B model, and also used some of the kind of technology from the space program. There's pros and cons to the capsule system, all in all, kind of more of a con, but it was a cool concept. I'll give him credit for that, but also a very rough landing. So with that, yeah, it's a swing wing design, so let's swing this one. With the Hobby Master, the wings are geared together, so when you move one, they both move. But you do have to manually rotate the ordnance underneath. Eh, good enough for government work. It's kind of a ball and socket, and it actually plugs into kind of a rubber area. So it has a little wiggle wobble, but generally speaking, holds pretty decent, especially the inboard. Now, there are a few different stations underneath. For one, Yardvark, although it was not named Yardvark officially at this point, did have an internal weapons bay with two attachments points inside. So it could carry bombs there. It also could carry additional fuel tankage there. Or it could carry an M61A1 cannon, 20mm cannon, although not often, 
It could also have pods underneath like this one does. There could be chaff or flare, jamming pods, electronic countermeasures. There's a station in the rear between the engines. And depending on what was in the bay, you could fit one kind of over there too. The wings had essentially four rotating pylons and all four were wet so they were plumbed for tanks although since this carried quite a large amount of fuel believe it or not tanks were not used all that frequently it had fuel in the wings fuel in the uh, body and like i said it could even mount extra fuel in the internal bay so that was typically the preference now there are outer hard points on the wings but they're non-rotating so if they were ever to be used Essentially, you had to stick your wings all the way out. And these would go anywhere from 16 degrees to 72 degrees, and they were manually adjusted. It was not automatic, although there were some automatic flight controls that as the uh, pilot would adjust the wings using a kind of a, a shifter, the plane itself would compensate flaps and ailerons and things like that. The tail would also be an all-moving each horizontal stabulator could actually move independently these of course were after burning turbofan engines and when this went into service it was the only swing wing aircraft to be a military service anywhere in the world so that's pretty neat it also had the mark one avionics package which for the time was quite advanced it had train following radar a quite advanced autopilot system what have you but it was still analog of course as was the cockpit so unless you fitted the cannon in the bay you didn't have that but it could actually carry quite a bit of weight over 30,000 pounds depending on exactly which model variant which you're hanging and each hard point under the wing was rated up to 5,000 pounds but that was more theoretical than practical rarely if ever was something that heavy be hung off one single point in this initial version, the F-111A could reach Mach 2.3 for what it's worth. And here we, like I said, have it in a Vietnam configuration. Combat Lancer, though, in 68 did not go well. Very quickly, half of the aircraft were lost to accidents. It actually was traced back to a subcontractor, but it had the fleet grounded for quite some time. They didn't start really reappearing in Vietnam until 71 and were used in force beginning in 72 with Operation Linebacker. As the aircraft had finally matured, they had a very good safety record. They flew 4,000 missions with only six combat losses. So, yeah, it's uh, pretty good. And the pilots liked flying them. They handled quite well considering how big they were. This was not and never intended to be a dogfighter. This was an interdictor. This was a bomb truck, especially the Navy version. And uh, here I have it kind of kitted out in a bit of a theoretical mode, but I wanted to show the two types of ordnance this particular version from 1975 from Hobby Master came with. On the center line, you can see the jammer pods, the Defensive pods there, they are removable. The one in the rear is pretty much always available. The one in the front kind of precludes the use of the bay. And we have Mark 82s on uh, multiple ejector racks. And if it were a short range mission, they would carry up to 24 of these, six per hard point for a total of 24. Each are 500 pounds plus the weight of the rack. They could also carry the 1,000 pound Mark 83 or the 2,000 pound Mark 84. Of course, those are on single mounts. Of course, unguided at this time, so mostly just you know conventional. They could also carry napalm cluster bombs, and they could even carry cargo containers usually made out of old napalm but yeah this one's pretty well fitted out 
And so yeah, short range missions, 24 Mark 82s. If they were doing a long range mission, they would usually decrease that to 12 Mark 82s. And sometimes they would attach a couple of external fuel tanks, but not always. Again, enough fuel on board. The big tanks did obviously give some drag. They were pretty heavy. They were usually 600 gallon. And typically once these were in Southeast Asia, that extreme range just wasn't needed. Of course, we have uh, landing gear that can be up or down because it's Hobby Master. This middle spot here is for the stand, but don't worry if you don't want it on the stand. There's a plug that goes in there. There's even a plug that goes on the side if you want to display yours with wings out. That kind of plugs the slot left by their movement, so quite thoughtful. And if you'd like to have your cockpit empty, you can display it with the canopy open. Uh, the, the two crew would actually open up kind of the side windows to get out. <laughs> so you can either have them in there or not with those open or closed. It's just one single piece. It's a pretty straightforward and, and pretty elegant model, if I say so myself. And you'll notice the early style intakes. We'll get to those later on. But yeah, that was one of the problem areas of all things, were actually the air intakes and the adjustments. One area that they would keep refining along with the engines themselves. This has the original wings, original landing gear. Like I said, Mark I avionics that's inside though. I do like this model. Metal wings, metal tail, Metal stabilizers. It's actually very die cast, which is cool. And very big too. Even a one cent issue scale. It's got the correct earlier style engines. And the 70s Southeast Asian paint scheme. So pretty neat. And uh one thing I like about the Yardvarks that Hobby Master usually get at least one alternative ordnance option, sometimes even two. They typically load these down. Despite the protracted development time, when the Air Force finally obtained this, it became quite a useful little tool. Medium range. It had about four times the carriage ability of the venerable F-4 Phantom, yet it was still smaller, cheaper, and this more cost effective to operate required far fewer crew than say a B-52 bomber or even the B-1B bomber, B-1A originally. It it filled the unique role. It really did. And so it it um it yeah it wasn't exactly a success. They hoped to build over fifteen hundred. They never reached near that number. But it wasn't canceled like so many of its contemporaries like the. TSR-2 over in the UK. So there's that. Of the original F-111A, they would build 159, including pre-production models that had been updated to the A standard. And they would remain in service for a considerable period of time. But with that, let's move to our first variant. Now we have to go back to the almost very beginning, back before the F-111 was the F-111, when it was just referred to as the TFX, Tactical Fighter Experimental. In 1963, the Air Force's SAC, Strategic Air Command, we've been talking about TAC, Tactical Air Command so far, but SAC found that it needed a medium range strategic supersonic bomber. The B-52 could deliver a payload, but it was large and required large airfields and so on and so forth. And the B-58 wasn't working out as planned. And this was really to be an interim measure into something more advanced could come along. Eventually this would be the B-1A, which would be cancelled in the Carter administration and then resurrected. In the 80s, a uh, story for another day is the B-1B. So the proposal came in 63 to alter the F-111A to the 
FB 111A. In 65, this was considered and pretty much hit upon. Remember, we have one developmental prototype or model being made. In, in December of 66, the Air Force SAC would sign a contract with General Dynamics. And the developmental model would first fly in July of 1967. And initially, SAC would consider as many as 263. This was quickly reduced to 210. And the first production models were available August of 1968. But this is when the program was really hitting a rocky point. Post the uh, Combat Lancer program in TAC, the UK had canceled the F-111K, the US Navy had canceled the F-111B, so the press wasn't fantastic. Thus, by 1969, the total number ordered would be further reduced to just 76 of the FB-111A. And these would be delivered between that time and 1971, and these would go into full SAC service by 1972. And, well, their mission was nuclear bombing. And it is very similar to tax model. And that was the idea. This little change is necessary. Now, the rear fuselage would be altered. It would actually be a little bit longer. The standard model was roughly 73 feet long. This would be a little over 75 feet. It would have more internal tankage, over 580 extra gallons inside. And you notice maybe the wings are a little longer. This long wing platform was actually borrowed from the F-111B, the carrier-based version. And uh, when they're retracted back, they're not that much wider, 34 feet versus 32 feet. But the spread is wider, 63 feet versus roughly 70 feet. So you're looking at uh, over 3 foot extensions per wing. This just gives better carriage ability. In fact, whereas the standard original A model could only lift about 30,000 pounds, this could lift 35,000 pounds. It had reworked pivoting hardpoints, and it also had heavier, dutier landing gear. Makes sense for the extra size and weight. And it had the Mark IIb avionics package which was a development of the Mark I, of course, and specialized for SAC's needs. For example, instead of an auto, a manual release of the ordnance, an automatic release when parameters were hit could be set, you know, in case of nuclear war. Nice to have an automated drop. And uh, it also had satellite communications and a star tracker for navigation and just several other improvements for long range, that kind of attack mission. And it would use the internal ordnance bay quite often, at least compared to the original. So here we have one here with the wings swept back. Let's move them forward and look what's under. Again, good enough for government work. Would it be nice if Hobby Master had figured out a way to make these rotate automatically as you pivot the wings? Absolutely. I don't know how they'd really do it and not make it a clockwork nightmare that was prone to breakage. It's one of the reasons I do like Hobby Master. When possible, they keep it simple because simple is durable, dependable. And they don't really often go in for gimmicks. But yeah... This would carry either the B-61 or B-43 nuclear bomb in the internal bay. Or it could carry a fuel tank in the internal bay. On the wings, it could carry two 
even four external tanks, again they're all plumbed, or it could carry none. And instead it could carry Boeing's AGM-69 SRAM, SRAM, SAM, SRAM, short range attack missile. Had a range of about 100 miles, could deliver a small but effective warhead. So we could have two or four of those on the wings with without tanks. There was even a profile with two of them in the internal bay and four tanks on the wings, I guess, if you really needed range. And that was pretty much what this would be fitted with in theory and even in practice during the 70s and 80s. Uh, there were some other things theoretically it could carry and might have been qualified for but never really was deployed with, like the B-83. And uh, it could carry conventional ordnance too, but it really didn't. I mean, why would it? So it was a very similar bird, but also a very, very different role and a very different kind of outfit. This one here, I believe, was from, uh, what, 7980, the Tiger Meat. So... Yeah, it's got the standoff missiles and does have the access to the internal bay. And here is the bottom. It comes with four of the uh, trams and it has the two tanks so you can do either or or none. It's got the internal bay there. Now again, if you want the wings fully out, you can fit the little spacers in and not only do they plug the gaps but they also keep the wings from folding in because they are very smooth and not a lot of resistance as usual we had the pilots in or out kind of the same features the uh, tf-30 p7 engines here are rendered and these did have updated triple plow intakes like I said, they would modify the intakes multiple times with the Yardvark. And this shows them there. A lot of nice little detail for the equipment. Of course, this had the ability to refuel in the air. The connection was behind the cockpit. So you could really tank this up and really give it a range. And it was supersonic still. A little bit slower than the TAC version. It was rated for Mach 2.0, so you know, a little slower, but you know, longer range, heavier payload, larger aircraft in general. Pretty neat. And these would continue to see frontline deployment throughout the entirety of the 1980s, even though they only made 76 of them. And here are the two versions together. Very similar, but also very different, and again, in the details. But these are just really the first generations, TAC and SAC. As I said earlier, there are a lot of variations of this, and of course, the one major foreign user. But before we go down under, let's uh, see what was up with the Aardvark throughout the 70s and the 80s, and, you know, product improvement. Because this was a very ambitious and very uh, high-tech electronic aircraft for its day and time. On the spinny thing, we have the F-111F, often called the Cadillac of Aardvarks. A uh, world apart from the original nickname of uh, McNamara's Folly <laughs> that was bannered about 65-66. And this was really the ultimate version, the last version made for TAC. But how we got there? Well, going back to 1967, so really even before uh, Combat Lancer, work began on the next generation with really ambitious avionics and uh, computer systems. This would become known as the F-111D, first appearing in 1970 and reaching combat readiness in 1972 well sort of the D model had a lot of changes including mark II avionics it had actual digital computers it actually had an early glass cockpit it even had multi-function displays of a sort 
new weapons management systems, navigation systems. The D also went to the stronger landing gear we looked at it with the FB-111A and uh, would have upgraded engines. It would have the TF-30 P9 engine and revised yet again Mark II triple plow intakes. In theory, it was much more capable, more automated, more pinpoint accuracy, more power, in theory. But they never really got the D model worked out. So it pretty much spent its life stateside, stationed in America of training, conversion, even into the 80s. They never could quite get it going. So they only built around 94 it would lead directly to an interim model, the F-111E, which would see service overseas, and they'd build 96 of those. It was basically an F-111A, but with a few product improvements that had been trimmed up for the D, like better intakes, better weapons management, but it still had analog avionics. It still relied on the TF-30 P3 engines. So yeah, the E was just kind of a um, bugs worked out version without a whole lot new going on. Again, I know there's a few little things, but it was pretty much what we saw in 68, 72 in Vietnam. And they would build those for a brief time in the early 70s. But then this model would come along, the F, and they would build these primarily between 73 and 76, making 106 of these. And this is an interesting combination of everything that had come before. It had the Mark IIb avionics, similar to what we saw in the FB-111A, but you know tweaked for ta uh, TAC versus SAC. It had upgraded engines, TF-30 P-100s, it had the updated intakes, had the stronger landing gear. It had a stronger uh, through box for the wings to pivot. Reinforcements here and there. Yeah, it was just you know done up real nice. And it didn't go too ambitious like the D, but it was definitely more ambitious than the E. And the F model would be further improved in the 80s. It would actually go to the TF-30 P-109 engines. And it would actually end up with digital avionics eventually. And it would get multifunction displays. So it was almost to the point of the D. But it actually worked and was reliable. So there's that. So the E's and the F's were the primary overseas. For example, being stationed in England, especially the E models and really provided the Aardvark fleet here. Now this one is uh, kind of a later style Air Force version and it has some additions underneath and it no longer has a bomb bay as such. And here it is with the wings fully deployed. No sweep to them. And it has kind of the updated stores. It's just still a bomb truck. Just a little more advanced one. Beginning in the early 80s, work began on installing some new systems. For example, it would get a forward-looking infrared. It would also get the PaveTac laser designator pod, which was now taking up the former bomb bay. Kind of in a little turret mount. They could even retract in to keep it safe and otherwise help designate targets for either the aardvark itself or friendlies and it could still de deliver conventional ordnance updated mark 82s on the multiple racks it could uh, deliver various guided paveways that kind of thing too thanks to the upgraded engines it had over 35% uh, more oomph which just helped things immensely including top speed in fact, it was almost able to hit supercruise. 
not quite. And uh, top speeds for some models, some variants, and some loads could hit over uh, Mach 2.3, some say even 2.5. At this point, the gun, which had never been heavily used, was pretty much officially taken out of option. I mean, it just wasn't really in service anymore. The designator pod and all that. And these were used for precision, long-range strikes. And by the 80s, they had long since left their teething phase behind, and these, and especially the F models, were very capable machines for what they were. And they were used. For example, April 1986, Operation El Dorado Canyon, 18 were assigned to strike targets in Libya which made the longest combat mission on record, over 13 hours round trip. And uh, they delivered their ordinance, at least to the targets they were given. It wasn't up to the pilots that they were given the right coordinates. It was up to them if they delivered them. And one aircraft was lost. I should point out that, of course, the electronic countermeasures, jammer pods, all that, had been updated continuously over the years, too keep pace with things. Also, they started fitting some with AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles, either on the outboard kind of shoulder stations of the wings, and there's even experimenting with putting them in the weapons bay, although I don't think they went much of anywhere. This wasn't done a whole lot, but you never know. Self-defense with the newer Sidewinders, it made sense to put them on aircraft, because otherwise this thing was only relying on its speed and agility, such as it was, for defense. And from there, the Aardvark really made a name for itself, beginning in 1990 when some were stationed in the Persian Gulf, Operation Desert Shield, turning into Operation Desert Storm in January of 1991. Sixty-six in total were uh, stationed over there. And uh, they really did well. 80% of the laser-guided munitions in theater were actually brought in by the Aardvark, even though the uh, stealth bomber, the F-117, gets a lot of attention and admiration. The F-111 still was there doing its duty, and uh, it destroyed well over 100 Iraqi tanks and similar armor. It was actually called tank plinking. And they would typically be fitted with a couple of large guided ordnance, you know, bunker buster type bombs. Early on, they would also fit them with sidewinders for defense, but once it was clear that a rock really just didn't have a way to get them, at least not reliably, they usually quit bothering with the sidewinders and they would uh, really show off their new capabilities of the updated F models there and America's newer guided ordnance. And it was uh, kind of a public redemption for an aircraft that honestly had a good record following 1972 in Southeast Asia, but it had a hard time shaking off its early stigma from 68. It, it just did. But 91 really made the F-111 something to be appreciated. I mean, El Dorado Canyon helped too, but this was very visible thing and that's kind of where we have this one here with the updates with the laser and with the uh, newer bombs on board and what have you but it was also a little bit of the swan song for the uh, version here because its days were very much numbered after the first gulf war so we come to the end of the road for the Aardvark. Really, the first ones to be taken out started in 1989 with the FB-111As. Now that the B-1B was coming around and, you know, with just the changing times, they started to be either retired or converted. Then we had the Gulf War. 
or immediately after it, June of 1991, any of the remaining F-111As that hadn't been converted were put into long-term storage, essentially to the boneyard. In 1992, they would be joined by the 111Ds, and no, they still weren't really working right. And then in 1995, so a few years later, the F-111Es would be retired. And then in 1996, finally, the F-111Fs would be retired. And it's kind of a parting gift to the aircraft. It was finally officially named the Aardvark, although it had been called that for literally decades by pilots, who were frankly rather fond of it. Long range, a lot of carriage abilities, could fly in any weather virtually, rather comfortable cockpit, all things considered. But that's of course not the end of the story, because going back to the 1960s, the U.S. Air Force was in need of a new electronic warfare aircraft to replace their quite old EB-57 Canberras and EB-66 Destroyers. And so we come to our next pig. You can see why when I store these on the shelf, I have to fold the wings in. <laughs> we come to the EF-111A Officially known as the Raven, and unofficially, the Spark Bark, and initially, the Electric Fox. These were not new produced planes, but rather conversions of the F-111A. And like I said, it goes back the 60s when the Air Force wanted to replace its aging electronic warfare countermeasures aircraft and it looked at the Navy's prowlers the conversions of well not conversions but the A6 updates the B models but it really just wasn't what they were wanting they wanted a penetration aircraft that was supersonic and that wasn't that so they kind of looked around a bit but as the newer versions of the aardvark came around in 1972 they decided hey let's look at the f-111a the original model so in 74 they worked with general dynamics and grumman the two experienced people with the plane for study concepts and in 75 Grumman this time was awarded with a contract to produce two prototypes updated to the new standard and the first would fly in 1977 and then they would update a total of 42 with the final one delivered to the Air Force in 1985 the first of the updated aircraft again the EF 111A Raven was delivered in November of 1981 and the first squadron hit readiness in 1983 and that allowed them to retire quite a few older planes so generally speaking it's the same body and layout but we've made quite a few changes same short wings but we now have the TF-30 P9 engines installed, the ones originally developed for the 11D, a little more oomph, because we're going to be carrying 6,000 pounds of electronics. Now, we had this big fairing on top here. The Navy used the ALQ-99, the ALK-99 pod on the uh, Prowler. Well, the Air Force used a variation of this, the ALQ-99E. And then we had additional jamming and electronic warfare equipment 
in the old weapons bay. Because this was unarmed. The only thing it could really carry on the wings were fuel tanks. It couldn't carry anti-radiation missiles. It did have a radar warning, an early warning system installed. Things of that nature. It had jamming equipment. Because it was electronic countermeasures and electronic warfare aircraft. So, yeah. But no way to defend itself directly. The cockpit was rearranged. All the flight controls were given, now given to the pilot. The second seater was purely an electronics officer. And uh, just in general, it was modernized. And they would continue to modernize these. There was a big program between 87 and 94 to update them, giving them digital computers, multi-function displays in the cockpit, I mean, you would expect an electronic aircraft to be kind of kept up to date. <laughs> so that makes perfect sense. So this is where some of the original A models went. They became Ravens. And they were used in El Dorado Canyon in 1986. They were also used Operation Just Cause over Panama in 1989. And, of course, they were deployed in 1991's Gulf War. And in that war, they had quite a good record. In fact, any time a Raven was on station providing its facilities and assistance, no Allied aircraft was lost to enemy action. And a funny event happened on January 17, 1991, when a Raven is credited with the downing of an Iraqi Mirage F-1. In more recent years, some party poopers have questioned this story's authenticity, but we don't care. It's a fun story. We're going to go with it. And then in February, one of these was lost when it hit the ground, trying to evade a missile from a different Iraqi Mirage F-1. So, you know, you win some, you lose some, quite literally. That was the only combat loss in that war and in fact only three ra ravens were lost in service with the u.s air force in general so quite a good safety record grumman did a good job updating and refurbishing these using technology from other things including some bits from the navy and these would continue on a little while after the others Finally being retired in 1998. So a couple years longer than the 111 Fs. So technically the final version in service. Of course these would be replaced by yet more modern electronic warfare aircraft. But there would actually be a bit of a gap in service with the Air Force for a time. In fact the Navy would sometimes have to fill it with their growlers story for another day though but yeah this is a neat one from hobby master you know and another one that probably only they would do it's got the big pod the short wings it only comes with fuel tanks which i just i don't display i think it looks neater kind of clean like this and unless you had a really long range mission that'd probably be how it would fly And it's important just because of where it ended up in the U.S. Air Force and the fact that Grumman worked on it is kind of cool too. Not many U.S. Air Force aircraft have Grumman on them. So that's what happened to the A models, at least, you know, about half of them. Well, I guess a third of them, sorry. But what about those FB-111As? Like I said, they started cycling those out of SAC service in 1989. What became of them? No longer needed as a medium-ranged strategic nuclear bomber. Beginning in 1989, some FB-111As were converted into F-111Gs. These were traditional, conventional bombers 
And when SAC was disbanded, dissolved away post-Cold War, they would fall under the command of the ACC. And from there, not much really would happen. <laughs> the conversion was very simple, mostly because the FB-111As could still do conventional. So really just retooling the controls, some of the avionics, kind of refreshing the aircraft. Keep in mind the FB-111As had all been made you know, quite a long time ago. But yeah, they were just reworked to, to deliver a conventional ordinance, and that's about it. But they really didn't even see much field use. They were pretty much kept stateside for training and reserve use, and only for a few years. How many were converted? Some say 34, some say 51. Take it as you will. 76 of the FB-111As were originally made, plus the one uh, you know, pre-production model. So, yeah, a little under half or a little over either way. A very light conversion, though. But already by 1993, post-Cold War, all the cuts happening. We see the other you know, A's and D's and E's getting retired. So the G's would also be mothballed. Of course, this one is sporting some rather non-conventional ordnance under the wings and has some rather down-under markings. That's because Australia would actually acquire 15 of the F-111Gs, the low flat-hour ones, for use in the Royal Australian Air Force. So some of them would get a second lease on life for a while. And that's a good transition as we leave kind of the final American version. There was talk of doing an F-111H, but it never went anywhere. So, yeah, we've kind of covered all the U.S. Air Force variants. They were never any used by the Navy. Just uh, the seven F-111Bs. But even though the B never went into production and never went on board a carrier... Work on it really did help other variations, including the large wing and what have you. So with that, let's talk about the Aussie Pig, the F-111C, and its variants. The Australian story. Really, the only foreign user of note the yard bar, but what a foreign user it turned out to be. Even though the number of aircraft were quite small, they made a huge impact, and this became very famous. And it all goes back to the mid-50s, post-Korean War. Just as the Canberra bomber is coming into service, known in America as the B-57, Australia knew it needed a new long-range strike attack bomber aircraft, also reconnaissance. And it did consider one of the British V-bombers, something I have done a video on here, although it has been a minute. They considered that around 56, but they were just too expensive. But they were hoping to get something new in play by 1959, but this would come and pass. By 1960, some of the government reminded that, well, we, we need something. We, we have a bit of a gap here. And our abilities, plus they wanted to coordinate with NATO. And nothing really happened again until about 62, when Indonesia started to get a little bit of a, sadder ra a sa excuse me, saber rattle going on. And this drove home the need. Now, if you go back to our previous aircraft video, we looked at the French Mirage 4. And I mentioned that Australia did consider it. And this is where it kind of pops in. They're kind of looking at what's available. In fact, they sent a team overseas in 1963 to examine mostly what was going on in the U.S., U.K., and France. France, yeah, was the Mirage. In the U.K., they saw the TSR-2, which was under development. 
in the U.S., they saw a lot, including, of course, the B-52, the B-47, the B-58, the F-4 Phantom, the A-5, and the underdevelopment TFX. And so they kind of evaluated which would be best for French needs. I said French, sorry. Australian. I've been doing this for a while. Forgive me. But with that faux pas, the French Mirage, they actually did like, and it was a little bit shortlisted, but it did not have the range, the endurance that they needed. Keep in mind that they were expecting over ocean travel. Next, the British TSR-2. It was felt to be too expensive and also too risky because it was still under development. What if it never came to fruition? At least the Mirage 4 was ready. Moving to the U.S., the B-52 and the B-58 were too large. They just would not suit Australian airfields and needs too much. The F-4 had kind of the opposite problem. It just did not have the range, the endurance, especially keep in mind we're talking about the original Phantoms here. You know, the, the B models, the C models, so on and so forth. The A-5 also did not suit. But the TFX, under development, but it had everything Australia was looking for. Payload, range, endurance, speed, modern radar, electronic countermeasures, all things that the Canberra was simply missing. So, October 24, 1963, the Australian government announced that they would be purchasing 24, enough for two squadrons, of the new TFX from the USA once it was ready, and they knew it would not be ready for a number of years. They planned to get 18 standard strike models, originally just to be the F-111A, and six of the in-development F-R-111A reconnaissance version. And uh, they would kind of keep a pace with things. And as it turns out, they were right. The uh, TSR-2 was canceled in 1965, which ironically left Britain to turn to the Yardvark themselves, and a version for them was designed known as the F 111K. In 1967, 50 were ordered for the RAF. But going back just a minute, the Australians originally wanted to buy just a standard version, but they needed to make changes for their own needs, and enough changes had been made that in 1966. This was redesignated as the F-111C. And with that, let's put the final model on the stand. This is a 111C. Essentially, they wanted the longer wings from the B, along with a longer ranged radio, again for the endurance, and various changes made for operating in the tropics, you know, humid environments ocean environments, what have you. And Australian engineers helped study metal fatigue and Australian pilots tested some of the prototypes. So Australia was very involved in their variant. And it would take shape kind of based on the new technologies. And the British... K model would use many of the same things, all kind of feeding off the B. But in early 1968, after the TSR 2 had been canceled, now the British government canceled the order for their Ardbark, their 50. The problem was General Dynamics was already building these, so they were ordered to tear down the ones that were already completed or partially completed. So some of the components for the British aircraft would appear in other test programs and projects and what have you. Moving ahead, 
July of that year, the first test flight of a C would take place, and in September, the first production model would be ready. But the program would continue to experience delays. Keep in mind, this is right after the uh, Combat Lancer program and some of the issues revealed there. So that would stall an already behind schedule program even more. So much so that in 1970, the U.S. would lease 24 F-4 Phantoms to Australia just to fill the gap. Even if they didn't quite have the range, they at least had a decent bomb load and gave them something modern. Because by this point, the Canberra, venerable as it is in an aircraft as much as I do like it, yeah, into Vietnam War like this, it's, it's out of date. Finally, though, by 1972, things are back on track. And in March of 73, Australia officially accepts the F-111C. And the first six are officially delivered to Australia that July. And then the next 18 are delivered in three more batches. So four batches total of six. So they did get their 24 that they ordered. But they did not get 18 strike aircraft and six reconnaissance. All were strike aircraft. That's because in 1971, the U.S. Air Force canceled their plans for the FR-111A, the reconnaissance version. Should also mention that Australia ended up really liking the F-4 Phantom, and there was consideration given to actually just retaining, you know, buying outright the Phantoms that they had, but in the end they decided it just was cost prohibitive with the new Aardvark coming on and whatever. So those would be returned. Well, 23 would be returned. One Phantom was lost to an accident because that's just kind of what happens in the militaries. So by the end of 73, the Aardvark fleet was up and running. And this version here, the Reconnaissance... The RF-111C would come about thanks to Australia. Here we are spread out and we've got two fuel tanks. Even though the program was canceled in the USA, in 71, the US agreed to sell the reconnaissance package, such as it was, to Australia. So between 79 and 80, they would convert four of their pigs as they were honestly affectionately known to reconnaissance birds now these rf 111 c's would still retain strike capabilities they weren't completely devoid of that they just had the reconnaissance package put into their uh, you know bay they had uh, four cameras and other types of sensors and a few other tweaks to the avionics pretty straightforward though and, uh, yeah, they would be used to you know, deploy the force. Should also mention that in 1982, the U.S. Air Force would send four F-111As to Australia as attrition replacements. And these would be updated to 111C standards by installing longer wings, heavier landing gear, and uh, other Australian equipment. And that would pretty much consist the fleet up to 28. 12 were kept on strike readiness. Up to 4 were on reconnaissance duty. Usually just 2 though. And then the others would be down for maintenance or on standby. And these were never ever used in combat. But they were a very effective deterrent as it were. And pretty much identical to large wing versions like the FB-111A, which is why when they picked up the G models in 1994, they actually agreed in 92 to take 15 low mileage G models, and then these were delivered by 1994. That actually bolstered the fleet up where they could have two complete squadrons, one primary is strike, one is conversion training, plus additional aircraft, plus they were able to retire some aircraft that were, you know, worn out. Meaning that 
a total of 43 aardvarks saw Australian service, although not all at once. Like I said, the full strength would be two squads. But yeah, the reconnaissance version here is kind of iconic. They did consider deploying these in 90 uh, Desert Shield or 91 Desert Storm, but they didn't. In 1999, they were deployed to East Timer, and the reconnaissance birds did fly missions there, but were never directly involved in combat. So they were used, but for more maintaining the peace than anything else. Pretty neat aircraft, though. And even if they had to, they could be converted back to the strike roll. But there were some interesting weapon systems employed on Australian Royal Air Force aardvarks, too. So with the Australian flown G back on the stand, you'll notice under the wings there are four missiles. These are one of the two unique weapon systems that Australia would use. This is the AGM-84 Harpoon. They would also outfit their planes for the AGM-142 Popeye standoff missile from Israel. Just really kind of their unique roles. The, these were for anti-shipping and the Popeyes were for, well, ground-based targets. Of course they could, could carry and did carry conventional bombs and whatnot. They would under, undergo the AUP as kind of a update program. Started in the 80s, the last aircraft would be done with the update and refurbishment by 1998. And they would get digital flight computers, updated cockpits, and they would get uh, laser pods for looking infrared. Kind of what we've seen in the U.S. Just done a little different for Australian standards. And uh, when they got the G models, they, they only did a few changes, including incorporating Australian weapon systems. But for the most part... They already had the hardware that Australia needed, even if it maybe was a generation behind what they had currently. It was still workable. should also point out that they mostly used the G models for training and as reserves. Still kind of putting the C models front and foremost, especially the ones converted for reconnaissance and the ones kept for strike. And all was going well. Um... In uh, 2006, an Australian pig, again, affectionate name because this was the fastest and really longest range, most deadly strike aircraft in the region. But anyway, one of these was assigned the glorious task of scuttling, sinking a North Korean drug smuggling ship with a couple of laser-guided bombs. So that was good. And it was kind of the last major note, because going back to 2001, during an inspection, they discovered a fatigue on a C model to the wings. So the next year, they decided to replace the wings with spares from the USA. Now, these were the A-style wings, so they had to be extended. But yeah, they were kind of concerned about aging, and uh, new wings were added to the fleet. And even though they originally planned to keep the Aardvark in service to 2020, with rising costs of operations, new technologies, changing needs of the Australian Air Force, and, you know, presumed uh, fatigue of the aircraft, by 2007, they started retiring planes. And mostly they, they retired G models. Because even though, they, even though they'd only had them for a little over a decade, keep in mind they were secondhand from the U.S. to begin with. And uh, by 2009, only about 18 were still in service. And they uh, were getting more and more expensive to maintain, keep flying, just because. So they started training true uh, troops, so pilots on the next generation. What they were going to do was purchase 24 F-18 Hornets from America as interim 
solution replacements, and that would let them retire their Aardvark fleet. And December 3, 2010, the last ones were finally retired. In 2011, they would bury 23 airframes. The reason they didn't just dismantle them, well, there was asbestos in the construction. Good old 60s, 70s asbestos. So it was felt too expensive to take them apart, so they just buried them in the desert. Six were kept for museum displays, though. And that was kind of the fate of the last flying aardvarks, because again, in the USA, even the electronic warfare versions had been retired back in 1998. And that is the... General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark story featuring mostly, yeah, the U.S. Air Force and uh, the Australian Royal Air Force. Even though a few other nations definitely considered it for a time. Can't really say it was a runaway success. Like I said, they originally planned to make 1,500. In total, they made 500. 63 with the last ones coming off the assembly line in 1976 but really by that point they were already really much winding down in the air force it was replaced by the f-15 mainly the f-15e strike eagle and did not have a direct influence on that however even though it never went into service ironically the navy's b model f-111b directly influenced little-known aircraft, the F-14 Tomcat. Very similar, almost identical TF-30 type engines. It used the AIM-54 Phoenix missile, originally developed for the, the B model. Two-seat, of course, and swing wing, of course. So, yeah, direct influence there. And, of course, Grumman had worked on the F-111B, and would develop the F-14. So I can't say that that was all a waste of time because without the F-111B, we might not have had that. Who knows? And in the Air Force, even though it took time, once they get to the F model, it proved very well in the 80s and really had a very, very good day in the 1991 Gulf War. In the the Raven, the electronic warfare aircraft, is often considered to have been retired before its time. In fact, when the Air Force retired it, many considered prematurely, it left them with a huge capability gap. So it actually proved to be quite an effective electronic warfare countermeasures bird. The B mod the FB 111A model, it, it did its job perfectly well as a nuclear strike strategic type aircraft and of course that transitions right over to the Australians it served them very well it gave them capability it was a huge step forward from the uh, Can Canberra it was probably good though that they had the F-4 Phantom as a loner in 1970 that let pilots kind of get caught up on the jet age before jumping into this thing Without that, the transition directly from the Canberra, you know, Mark 20 to this would have been pretty jarring. But it gave them a capability and gave them a leg up over their neighbors and kept the region stable. Since it was never directly used in combat, we can pretty easily say that. And Australia was the only nation to fly a reconnaissance version. So that's pretty cool. And, uh... Well, the UK rejecting the K model. Yeah, that's just the UK for that era and time. What can you do? And of course, none are flying today. Its day has come and gone. It was very advanced, but yeah. Swing wing technology was applicable in the 60s, but with computerized control, fly-by-wire, it became unnecessary. You know, modern jets don't have to really use it. Of course, the Soviet Union also had the MiG-29 
23 and a couple of Sukhois that use swing wing too. So that's kind of interesting. And the British would go for their Tornado. So it was definitely not the only aircraft of this kind of pattern and type. But I think it's interesting. It's a big aircraft. 75, 76 feet long. Wingspan of 63 to 70 feet wide, depending on the exact model. Heavy. Anywhere between 30 and 35,000 pounds carriage ability. Fast. Mach 2. Mach 2.3 on some models, even greater. Not the highest altitude known to man, but was it ever meant to be 45, 50,000 feet? It was always meant to be low and fast. And it did have a very advanced train following radar and uh, autopilot again for its day and time. And it was, after the initial teasing phase, very successful in the latter stages of Vietnam. But that's often overshadowed. In Australia, seven. C models were lost to accidents over the years, and one G model, so eight Australian aardvarks were lost, and uh, that claimed the lives of ten of the crew. Because of the ejection system, the capsule, it was kind of, a, you know, either both would make it or neither would, most likely. And, uh, yeah, it had pros and cons. In the reality, it wasn't really any more hazardous than a standard ejection seat of the day for a supersonic. That was the main deal, was trying to figure out how to do ejections at supersonic speeds in the 60s. But of course, newer Martin Baker ejection seats have kind of overcome a lot of those issues. And of course, a lot of supersonic ejections don't happen. But day and the time. So that's kind of the record, guys. So I'm curious, which is your favorite variant? I am kind of partial to the FB-111A, I can't lie. It's quite interesting. But I also do kind of like the Combat Lancer look, the, just the, the bomb truck with the up to 24 Mark 82s. Just, just dump a bunch of dumb bombs on them. That'll, that'll do it. <laughs> but yeah, let me know in the comments which ones you prefer. Hobby Master has done quite a few different ones. And again, the differences tend to be in the engines... The intakes, of course the ordnance, the wings, and a little bit in the rear section of the fuselage. With that, this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.